finished Habakkuk a few weeks ago and had a few weeks before we begin to consider the incarnation. And so I wanted to take a few weeks here to consider gratitude and the biblical nature of gratitude. And uh, of course, last week we were looking at how important gratitude is in our life. And this week we're going to see the importance of gratitude in worship. And last week we saw that it was gratitude in prayer from Philippians 4. And then today we'll see gratitude in worship. Uh, you, if you were to title this today, this would be a pattern for worship is what we're, uh, what I'm calling this sermon here. Yeah, I've often heard this. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen the, the meme, the joke on Facebook. I've seen it other places. We'll yell for our sports teams and not for the things of God. And people will, I've heard, seen people push back on that. Well, those are different scenarios with different purposes. That's not fitting for the house of God. And I, I get that, but I'm a little concerned sometimes that we separate those things and miss the wholehearted passion that believers should have as they come into God's presence. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this at the beginning of this. I'm going to say it again later on in this message. I love the way that our church sings. I love the way that we come into God's presence. This is not meant to scold in any way or correct in any way. It is to encourage us to continue what we're already doing and to go even deeper in it. Because even as I know we come in here and we worship the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, there are some days that we come in here and it is half-hearted for some of us. It does lack focus. I have those days sometimes. And so how do we, how do we move beyond just this up and down when that comes what we see here, what we're going to see here in Psalm 100 is a biblical pattern for worship that will help us worship the Lord the way that He deserves day in and day out. This wholehearted passion that we're talking about, I was thinking about it on the personal level, you know, we're talking about yelling uh, at, for our teams and that type of thing. Why is it that I'm willing to shout at the TV when Georgia whips Tennessee again and then hold back in my singing about how the lion roars and declares that the grave has no hold on me. That why would I be half-hearted in one at times and full-hearted in the other? Now, maybe you're not the shouting at the TV type person. Maybe you're not the shouting type person at all. But there is something in your life that will command your passion, your focus, and your response. And it's going to look different for different, different people. But the question is, if that thing can claim your passion, your focus, and your response, how much more should the risen King of Kings command our passion, our focus, and our response? Jesus Christ is worth no less than that. So, yes, while yelling at a church gathering might not be appropriate, my father-in-law is here today, and a long time ago, this was probably 20 years ago, we went to a preacher's meeting. It was in, in Atlanta. And we went to this preacher's meeting. There was someone up on the stage who was preaching. And there was this guy behind us. And um, annoying doesn't begin to describe him. But uh, he's standing up all the time while the guy's preaching. He's standing up every few minutes. That's right, brother! I mean, just over and over, like through the whole thing, he gave, gave dad a splitting headache. And finally, the pastor who was preaching was like, brother, I appreciate you praising God, but when you're covering up what I'm saying, we got a problem here. So while that's not appropriate, listen, church, shouts of joy are, at the very least, there should be the same passion and intensity as anything else that we would tackle of importance in our lives. And this is what Psalm 100, and by the way, not just Psalm 100, a lot of other psalms point us to this. Psalm 100 is a short psalm that packs a powerful punch. In, in five short verses, we'll see an outline for worship. It's not comprehensive. There's more to this. It doesn't get in necessarily into the forms of worship or anything like that, but it gets to the heart of worship. And it gives us two key aspects of biblical worship. And we're going to see, ultimately, that biblical worship is rooted in gratitude. Biblical worship is going to flow from and be rooted in gratitude. It begins with a command. 
And then two principles that help us fulfill the command. Psalm 100. Follow along in your Bibles as I read it. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever in His faithfulness to all generations. If you were to uh, have a thought, a big thought that we take home from this today that summarizes this, it's this. Gratitude is the foundation of worship. Gratitude is the foundation of worship. Would you ask the Lord to speak to you through His Word today as I ask Him to speak through me? Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I ask that you would help me to adequately proclaim the Word, to proclaim the glories of Christ, to proclaim His goodness, Lord, that the truth that is here would find deep root in our heart. Holy Spirit, I yield to you. I, I am I am yours. I am a vessel that, that I, I want to be filled to use for the glory of Christ. And Lord, I, I believe that we have the right to ask for that because of the work for Jesus and the, of, of Jesus and the promises that you've given us that you would help. Lord, help me to not speak with the enticing words of man's wisdom. Oh God, let it be in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as Psalm 100 develops, we see the biblical pattern for worship. And it's this. First of all, it's joyful singing. This is a command. Here's the command. This is what God is looking for from His people as they gather. Joyful singing. This psalm centers on singing praise to God. Now, people sing about things that are important to them. Have you ever noticed that? People sing about, like, you don't have to be a Christian to sing about something that's important to you. Like, the things that people sing about in non Christian music and secular music, that tells me what's important to them. We sing about the things that we love. Now, men, men sing about women. I, isn't that what people have been doing, men have been doing forever? I, I've always wondered when I hear country music why the men are always singing about how awesome the women are and the women never do the same thing about the men. Just remember that. The women sing what's important to them. Men sing about what's important to them. Music expresses what is in our heart just about better than anything else. When When you... Think about it. There is effort there to artistically arrange things in a way or to arrange words in a way that moves people. And Christian music that's used in worship should be artistically arranged in a way that moves people to worship God. Powerless, emotionless music is a travesty to a risen Savior. And it shouldn't be that way. This is something that God expects and that He commands. And He has created an avenue for us to worship Him. Now, notice the way that we're told to sing. uh, The the way that we're told to worship God here, commanded to. We're told, first of all, to make a joyful noise. If you're making notes, you could put this. It's raise a shout, give a blast. That's what it means. The the same word is translated in Psalm 66, uh, verse 1, as shout for joy to God. Now, that, that pushes back on going through the motions because here's the thing about shouting. You can't really shout half hearted. Are you really shouting if it's half hearted? Now, okay, then the other question that we need to answer in this, if it's supposed to be joyful, that means you can't fake joy. Joy is something that, that is inexplicable, that flows from, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in the sermon yet, but let's put it, it flows from truth. That's where joy comes from. So when, when we are singing to God, He says to raise a shout, to give a blast. There's nothing half-hearted about this. Half-hearted praise is a sad thing. Brothers, just ask your wives if they like distracted praise. The wives 
says, how do I look in this? Okay, I guess. How do you think that's going to go over? And Hannah says, no, not good at all. But there is a danger in this. Here's, here's the thing. Like whenever we talk about this, there is a, a, a danger, and I've seen this, and I think I've done this before. There is a danger in faking this. Because you can fake, you can fake emotion. You can, you can do things. As a matter of fact, um, and we're going to talk about this, that you do not. Uh, th this is not saying in any way that somebody has to raise their hands or do certain things as far as the way that they worship God. This is about our heart and the way that we express ourselves full-heartedly in our worship. This is not saying that at all whatsoever. But I've seen it and I've been in places where you have worship leaders who are like, everybody saying, everybody put your hands up. Everybody do this. You're encouraging people to fake it at that point. This is something that needs to be genuine and from the heart. And so there is a danger in faking this. Displays of emotion that seem spiritual. But it's not shouts, as I said earlier. It's shouts of joy. How do you get to that point of joy to where it's genuine? Well, keep listening. What's the next thing he says? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Now, who is this written to? Well, this was originally written to... Jewish people, right? Now it's interesting that the psalmist here is writing to Jewish people and what's he saying? All the earth needs to shout for joy. The Gentiles are ultimately uh, here as well. All the earth, he's looking forward to today that all the earth would one day praise God as the nations are welcomed in as a part of God's people. It reminds me of what Zechariah sang or prophesied as his tongue is loosed after John the after he's found out that John the Baptist is going to be born, and this is what Je Zechariah says: the sunrise from on high visits the Jews, or will visit the Jews and the Gentiles, and will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, guiding our feet into the way of peace. And boy, has that happened! There is a light that has risen in the darkness. We as Gentiles are sitting here today in the light of Christ, and guess what is happening all around the globe. Today, at different hours, because we've got different time zones, what's happening all around the globe today at different times? you got Gentiles, you got people all over the earth making a joyful noise to the Lord because of the goodness of God. Then he says that it should be with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Let's illustrate this way. Let's say, let's serve the Lord with gladness versus duty. This is what I get to do, not what I have to do. You know, we, uh, I think of two ways we can illustrate this. Um, sometimes we've illustrated in our, uh, with, with our kids, uh, they'll say something like, ah, uh, oh, do we have to go? Oh, we get to go to church. This is a privilege. This is a blessing. But, but you know this as well. Uh, Casey and I, Every Saturday morning, unless there's something big going on, we get together and uh, we go out for coffee. We go to Aromas. Uh, we go back and forth between Aromas Uptown and Aromas uh, Village because we know people at both places. Uh, by the way, if you want a really, really, really good coffee made, go see Hannah. Hannah can uh, make some of the best. She doesn't like coffee, but she makes some of the best coffee. So uh, we'll go over there and we'll, we'll hang out there for two hours sometimes. Uh, I, I would love to tell you that we're just sitting there in deep thought, talking to each other. I'm working sometimes. She's reading, but we're together. But what would it be like if it's like, okay, I guess I have to go to coffee again. I get to go to coffee. How am I doing? I get to go to coffee. This is fantastic. This is great. This is what he, he's talking about here. We serve the Lord with gladness, not out of duty. And then this is what he says to come to His presence with singing, or to approach God with singing. Here's the thing about music. God built music into creation for our enjoyment. It is one of His good gifts. But even more important than 
him building music into creation for our enjoyment, he also put it there as a vehicle to praise him. Because this is what music does. Music moves us. Music teaches us. Music catechizes us. To, to catechize means to instill truth that doesn't leave. Have you ever noticed how there's a song that you know from 20 years ago, and you haven't heard that song in forever, and it'll come on, you know, every word of it. it, it, it and so when we, when we make Christian music like this, and, and like we sing here, when we make it our main diet of music, what we're doing is, is we're instilling truth deep in our hearts. That's why we need to be careful about the music that we listen to and sing. Because we don't want to plant false ideas about God in our minds and in our hearts. We want it to be doctrinally sound, doctrinally deep, Christ-focused, gospel-saturated, focusing on the character and nature of God because we want that truth to be burned deep into our hearts and our souls. Music helps us express praise to God. Think about how God uses music for His glory. First of all, I, this is the way I want you to think about this. God is a singing God. God is a singing God. Uh, creation. How do we know this? Well, first of all, He talks about creation breaking in the song. He made creation to sing. And, and if, you, if you doubt that, just go outside where you can get away from all the sounds of everything and listen to birds. Like one of one of my favorite things is when the early summer comes and I go somewhere and I hear the first whippoorwill. That's so beautiful. God, God did that. And, and as Psalm 19 says, it talks about uh, the heavens declaring the glory of God and the firmament showing His handiwork. We see that. Turn over to Psalm 148. Uh, listen to who all gets into praise here. The praise of God. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created, and He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling His word, mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all living stock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth, all peoples, princes, and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and heaven. He has raised a horn up for His people. Praise for all His saints, for the people of Israel who are near to Him. Praise the Lord. All of creation gets in on this thing of praise. And how sad, how tragic is it if all of creation is praising God and His people are sleepwalking through that when we gather together. We're sleepwalking through that when we open our Scriptures in the morning and we go immediately to praying and demanding instead of coming back with thanksgiving for what He's done. Creation breaks into praise. Did you know that God sings? In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, I love this. This is looking forward to the day that Jesus comes back to restore the fortunes of Israel. And this is what it says, On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, this is when Jesus returns, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I can't wait to hear Jesus sing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you no longer suffer reproach. 
And this means, as we look at that, this funnels down to this truth that we see here in Psalm 100, that we should be people who sing. If creation sings and God sings, how, God sings, how much more should His redeemed sing? The psalmist knows that we should, so much so that he says that when we come into His presence, we should do it with singing. Psalm 149. You're start, probably still in Psalm 148. Psalm 149, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but like, just listen to this. And the characteristic of it, the nature of this worship, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. That's right here, right? Let them praise His name with dancing, making melody to Him with tambourine and lie. Lyre. A tambourine is something that's been used for a long time. I've never heard a tambourine that didn't provide rhythm. That's what it does. That that is an acceptable part of music. Let them praise Him with dancing, making melody to Him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. It, like when, when the people of God gather, there are times, there are times, Yes, when we should be somber, but that should not be the main thrust of what we're doing. We should be exulting in Christ and what He's done. Colossians 3.16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you, read all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another. What? In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Listen, when we're here singing, we're singing to God, Absolutely, but we're singing to each other as well. We're instructing each other. And you've heard me say this before, but when you are singing, when you sing with all of your heart, even when things aren't good, even when things are bad, what's happening here is you've got this person sitting over here watching this person who knows the trial they're going through, and they see them singing with all of their heart, even though things are crummy around them. And it strengthens this person over here. We exhort each other with our singing. We lift our eyes up to Christ. And when we can sing despite our circumstances, it is something that brings glory to God. It is something that helps us. Turn over to Revelation chapter 5. Here we have the 24 elders falling down before the Lamb and singing. You can start in verse 8. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you made them a kingdom, and priests are our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard a throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the sea, uh, under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them saying to him that's on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Then it says that the elders fell down and worshiped. We should be singing people, worshiping people. Now, I want to. Uh, add here something very important. And I, I think in, in modern American Christianity, we've done ourselves a disservice to think of worship solely as music. It is not that. It is more than that. We're dealing with what Psalm 100 is talking about here, which deals with aspect of worship. But we need to understand that if worship is ascribing value to God, 
and 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 uh, giving him the worth that he is due, then that means that our work can be worship. Because the way that we work shows the value of God. The way that we listen to the sermon and respond to the sermon can be worship and is part of worship. The way that we enjoy the world around us is part of worship. But singing is a vital part of that. And our singing should be wholehearted, full-throated, and with unreserved abandonment, shouts of joy. So for us as a church, that means when we gather here together, it means it's all of us. As I said earlier, Colossians 3.16 says that we sing to one another. Here's the deal. When you become a member of Greenwood Baptist Church, you become a member of the choir. This is our choir right here. This is our choir. And, and every Sunday, you get to come in with all the other saints. You don't have to worry about somebody performing up here. You don't have to worry about sitting there passively in your mind wondering. If you want to, you can join in the choir in praising God. Because it's all of us. What a privilege to do that. Now, we still haven't kind of hit on how we just don't fake it. Like, how do you come in and make the joyful noise? What is the source of joy? Just coming in and doing, just uh, revving the engines, doing all that we can. Well, I, I think we need to be willing to do that. But look at what he says. We understand that Psalm 100 is a biblical pattern for worship, that it is joyful singing that flows from the knowledge of God. Know that the Lord is God. Verse 3. It is He who made us. We are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Worship flows from knowledge of God. So how do we this way? Is it based on how we feel? Alistair Begg, who's one of my favorite preachers, uh, he was preaching one time at the Ligonier Conference, and uh, he got up and he, he said, uh, I was at this place once, and he said, you know, they, they had music playing beforehand and everything. And um, he says, I'm going to speak. And he says, the guy who's leading the music gets up there and he says, how y'all feel this morning? And Beg says, how do I feel? What kind of New Testament question is that? He said, if I told y'all how I feel this morning, especially in light of the past five minutes, you might wonder if I'm even a Christian. Don't ask me don't ask me how I feel. Ask me what I know. He goes on and he says, Ask me what I know about God, about His Word, things that I can know of truth in my soul. That's what I need. Don't make me sing songs about how I feel. Don't make me sing repetitive songs about how I feel. I'm barely moving that early in the morning. I got an argument with someone who took my parking space on the way to church. I spilled my coffee on the way to church. I didn't read my Bible this week. I'm a miser miserable wreck. You want me to start here with how I feel? I feel rotten. That's how I feel. That's what he said. And then he says, that's why we have to get ourselves under the control of the Scriptures. The truths of the Scriptures that fuel our hearts and emotions and lead us on. Hence for us this morning, we sang, come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon the tree, in the stead of ruined sinners, hates the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. He goes on to say, he used a different song in there, but he goes on to say, okay, now I have something to sing for, because you've reminded me of truth. So that's why when we come in here on Sunday mornings, we do a call to worship. It's not an old traditional thing that people have just done for hundreds and, and, and more than a millennia. It's not just something that they do. Like the first thing that we hear when it's time to begin our time of worship is God speaking to us truth about who He is. Him calling us to worship us. Him reminding us who He is. That's why we have that call to worship. 
That's what the psalmist does here. He calls us to praise and then he moves on to what we know. He says, remember who He is. He is our sovereign God. He is our Creator. It is He who has made us. He is our Shepherd. We are His people. The sheep of His pasture. Meaning, we, He is our Shepherd. What a blessed place to be, to be cared for by the Creator of the universe. If you know your week can be crummy, but you can come in and be immediately reminded that the Creator of the universe is your shepherd and that He loves you. And that that dead, cold heart that's had to walk in this nasty world all week, guess what? It begins to flicker a little bit. Yeah, that's who He is. Yeah, that's what He's done. Remember who He is. Then He says, understand who we are. Know the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and we are His. We are His people. Who are we? We're His people. We're the sheep of His pasture. We're vulnerable. We're needy. We need to be protected. We need to be defended. We need to be rescued by the Good Shepherd. So, worship in music, as we come together as a church, worship in music is a constant reminder that the world does not revolve around us. Remember who we are. I want to be I want to be careful here because I understand that different people have different personalities. Okay? And I understand that some people are self-conscious about the way that they sing. But understand, the singing isn't about you. It's not about how you sound. It's not about how it might impress other people. The singing is about God and what He's done for us. And I think that sometimes a refusal to sing can be a subtle form of pride. Because we think that our image we are trying to portray trumps the call to give God glory. And this is especially, men, I'm going to say this is especially true of us. It is very easy for men to sit back with their hands in their pocket and just be a passive bystander. Can I tell you what your children do not need? They do not need to see their father a passive bystander as God's people are singing His praises. You, wanna, you want your children to think that God is something awesome and special? Then set aside your pride and sing about how awesome and special He is. One of my best friends in the world is one of the worst singers in the world. I'm not lying. I mean, you could go an entire song and he will not hit one single note at the right time. He's hitting notes, but not one single note at the right time. Just and he acknowledges this. And and he and he's told me I, I was very self-conscious about it for a long time. He says I finally just got to the point to where I I I don't care. And so he sits there and he caterwauls while everybody else sings. It is a joyful noise after all. <laughs> but we still haven't exactly answered what would cause human beings to abandon themselves and worship to God without reserve. I mean, we've got knowledge. Yes, we know this flows from knowledge. What would cause us, as verse 4 says, to enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise, to give thanks to Him and to bless His name? For them it would have been the temple. For us here by application, it's us gathering together to worship Christ. For this to happen, we need truth that moves our heads and that moves our hearts. We need hearts 
that are warmed by the fire of the gospel. We need emotions that are trained by truth, but are fired by grace. And I love what the psalmist does here. Here's truth. Here's truth. Here's truth. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. And there's a very important word in verse 5. For. That word for means because. Do this. Because the Lord is good. Look at this. So we the biblical pattern of worship is joyful singing that flows from the knowledge of God and that is rooted in gratitude. This is where we get to the foundation. What would cause people to make this joyful noise? To sing with the passionate heart? To come into God's presence with singing? To enter His courts with thanksgiving and praise? To bless His name? It is because the Lord is good. Do you believe that? No caveats. The Lord is good. You remember when we were looking in James chapter 1, verse 17, and we talked about how every good gift come, comes down from the Father of light? Remember what we said there? I think that this is important here. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is the Father of lights, meaning the sun, the moon, and the stars, but He is unlike those lights in that He never, ever changes. Comets come and go out of our sight. Have you seen the comet a few weeks ago that was here? Comets come and go out of our sight. The northern lights, if you hold your phone up the right way, you might be able to see it down here. Those things change. The moon disappears view for days at a time. The sun sets over the horizon every night. Shadows move throughout the day. But God in His nature, specifically here, His goodness, James says, is unrelenting. It's unmoving. It's not fickle like the weather. It's not a fleeting shadow. The Lord is good. And what, they, what the psalmist is calling us here is to remember again the goodness of God. Remember that His goodness is pervasive and that there is never a moment that His goodness flickers or fades. Remember that every bit of good in your life flows from the unchanging and unrelenting kindness of His heart. Every good in your life is from God. He is good. In His ways. He is good in His will. He is good in His working. He is good. God has never once done a single one of His children wrong. And He never will. Just stop to think about the many evidences of His goodness in your life. Last week I gave you a, a prayer guide, a, a gratitude prayer guide between now and Thanksgiving. Uh, today, this one's especially important to uh, to me, we're thanking God for rest today. You know what I'm going to do this afternoon? For a long time. Casey told me this morning, uh, as soon as we woke up, she says, I'm coming right back here after church. I was like, oh, you're coming home? She's like, no, right back to the bed. We're thanking God for thanking God for rest today. Uh, transportation, clothes, creation, scripture, the person who led you to Christ, freedom, our church, God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the gospel. Those are all things, evidences of God's goodness in your life. He says, praise God for or because He is good. And then the next thing that He says is His love never changes. His steadfast love, steadfast, never moving, never changing. His steadfast love endures forever. It's not up. It's not down. It's not petty. It's not uh, giving you the silent treatment because you upset Him. It's not selfish. He, he doesn't love us because we do things for Him. Like If you doubt the steadfast love of God, just think, just think about the whole arc of Scripture, okay? Let's go back to the beginning. From the beginning, Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God. And the moment they rebelled against God, it broke fellowship with God. But what did He immediately do? He provided a covering for their sin immediately. And He immediately gave Eve a promise. Hey, the person, the wicked person, the wicked being that brought this evil in the world, I'm coming to crush his head. And we see from that moment, God being steadfast to His people. It doesn't matter how much they leave Him, how much they forsake Him. Israel, over and over and over again, 
forsakes God. Yet Jesus comes to Israel as their Messiah. And you know what? After that, Israel still rebels. And I happen to believe that even though Israel still rebel, or has rebelled, that God is still a God of steadfast love, and He is going to come again to save His covenant people. That's steadfast love. That's never changing love. You, think about your failure over and over again. Days, weeks, and months of lukewarmness just going through the motions. Seasons of backsliding, spiritual idolatry, clinging to bitterness, going into the world, thinking that it's the world that's going to be satisfy you. But you have a Lord who stands there like the father of the prodigal son, standing and gazing out over the horizon, waiting for the child to return because He has not left you. You left Him. His love is steadfast. He'll never back down. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's good and He has steadfast love. He's never once wavered in His love for you. And it's the cross that gives us this confidence because it was there that Jesus Christ died for you when you were at your worst, when every single one of your sins were future. It was there that His steadfast love was held high for all the world to see. We have a God who from the beginning promised to crush Satan's head. And you know what? He's been playing because He's a God of steadfast love. He's been playing the long game by defeating the grave and His death at the cross. And that same Jesus is still playing the long game, steadfastly moving to the day that He returns and the full victory of the cross is realized by those who have trusted Him. How is that going to happen? Think about this. 1 Corinthians 15, I, uh, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trump will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on in the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, O death. Death, where is your sting? And that only happens because there is a God who has steadfast love, who from the beginning set that love on His people and has steadfastly carried it out and will bring the purpose of that love to fruition one day when we all get to gather around the throne and worship the Lamb in person saying worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and wealth and wisdom and power. That kind of steadfast love is the love that our God has. Not only is He good, not only is His love steadfast, it says that His faithfulness endures to all generations. He is forever faithful. He has steadfast love that is constant and never changing. He is also faithful to every generation. When your friends forsake you, He's there. When your spouse lets you down, He's there. When your children turn their backs on you, He's there. When your pastor fails you, which has happened and will happen. He's there. Never leaving, never forsaking. And amazingly enough, Paul even tells us in 1 Timothy that when we are faithless, He is faithful. Wow. So His faithfulness, as we look at this, we ask the question, why? Hey, like, how? Why would He do this? Why would He be faithful in this way? And this is what's so important for us to remember is that His love is never predicated on who we are and what we've done. God's love is not predicated on that. His love is set on you because of who Christ is and what He's done. So His faithfulness isn't based on your performance because when He saved you, it wasn't based on your performance. Now, that leads us to want to live holy lives, to live lives that please Him, to be living sacrifices because of what He's done. 
But that is a response to love. That is not an action to gain His love. So how does verse 1's joyful noise, shouts of praise, show up in our worship? It flows from a knowledge of God. It's rooted in gratitude. It's not necessarily rooted in uh, movement while you're singing or hand raising. Those things are good and fine. But in reality, it is singing with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength from a heart of gratitude. That's what would cause that kind of worship. Who He is, what He's done. This is, this is why... I'm just telling you our philosophy here, okay? I'm, I'm not throwing stones at anyone else in any other church in the way that they do. I'm just talking about our philosophy here. This is why we are. I am so careful about the music that we sing. We try to not sing me-focused music. Try to sing Christ focused music. That also means that we we try to I try to pick music that is singable for all voice ranges. Let's just put it, I want it to be beltable. We try to make it saturated in the gospel, rooted in Christ and his work for us, and God and his sovereignty and His good providence for His people. Those are the things that we need to hear. Those are the things that, that move us to praise. I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I say I've never done it. I I've, I've think a long, several years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, I did this. Um, I want to show you what this looks like. This is actually not uh, from a, uh, this is not a Christian song. It's not Christians who are singing this song. But I, I want to show you what it looks like to sing with every fiber of your being. Now, there's a, there's a pastor, somebody asked him once, a young pastor asked him, he's like, is it okay to show videos while you preach? And this guy says, well, if you can't preach, by all means, show videos. But if you can preach, preach! That's what he said. If you can preach, preach! The problem is, that guy has fallen into sin and disqualified himself, so I'm just going to take what he said and put it to the side here. And I'm going to show you something that I, I think might illustrate this. Again, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not Christian. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, let me set the stage for you here. And again, I'm, I'm wanting you to look at how people are singing with all that they have, not necessarily clapping or mu movements or anything like that. About seven years ago, I first saw this video, and I saved it, and I said, there's, there's a day that I think this is going to illustrate an important screw, a truth for God's people. I've been holding on to it for seven years. Um, this is actually from a film called The Greatest Showman, and it's about P.T. Barnum, and how he got his life all messed up, focused on himself. And uh, as he focused on himself, he ruined his family, he ruined his life, and he comes to this moment to where he's singing from now on. This is, this is not the way that I'm going to be anymore. This is the practice for it. This isn't even in the film itself. This is the practice for it. As a matter of fact, it's the first time this group of people have gotten together to sing and to practice this. The guy who's singing, his name is Hugh Jackman, he's actually had nasal surgery, and the doctor told him not to sing. He's, he's had some cancer removed from his nose and has a hole in his nose, evidently. And the doctor has told him not to sing. Uh, but he gets caught up in the moment and he sings, and he sings anyway. All right, 
Um, I might not have a job after this, but let's just see. Uh, let's see how this goes. All right, Matt, go ahead. That's him. You can't see the hole in this kind of Somebody give me a five someday. I'm ready. You, that was a practice that was not supposed to go that way. There was one person who sang with all of their heart. And look at what it did. I appreciate Bill Hosey up here every Sunday. He, he's our cheerleader. But church, they were, they were singing about something good. It didn't hold back. I mean, in, in a few minutes, in a few minutes, we're going to sing my sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, 
but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Is that going to be with all we have? We're going to be belting it out to where if somebody walked in off the street here, they're going to think, wow, these people really believe this. This really moves them. What, what keeps God's people from singing with that passion? Shouts of joy from people who are looking hell in the eye and were rescued even though they deserve that awful judgment. Distraction. Going through the motions. And let me tell you what I think one of the biggest reasons why we don't do that is is we get bored with the gospel. We want something deeper. We want something better. There ain't nothing better than that. And I don't care how long you work and you study the gospel, you're never going to get to the depth of the goodness of it and never get to the depth of the bottom of the meaning of it. Everything flows from that. So how can you have a joyful noise worship yield to God, your pride and your self-conscious reticence? You aren't performing anyone, you're worshiping God. As I said earlier, men lead, show your sons unhindered and unashamed worship. The men's voices in this church should be the loudest. Your voices are louder than the women's voices. They ought to be booming over the women's voices here. Leading our church in the battle. Leading our church into the cry of victory. Prepare the night before. That's part of the way you can do this. Just start to think about the fact that you're going to encounter the living God the next day. And then finally, preach the gospel to yourself daily. Wonder what God has done for you over and over and over and over again. It makes it so that when you come down, come in here, and we've had that down week, that our soul is warmed more easily by the truth that we sing. If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed. Believer.